Welcome to the listeners of Tal Radio English CXO Showtime. We bring in global CXOs on this platform to share their journey to success. Our guest today is David Arurk, CEO at Hockenham Valley Community Council in Vernon, Connecticut. David has over 30 years of experience in mental health as a behaviorist. Through his collaboration with healthcare officials, social service agencies, state and local governments, David has developed a core understanding of what it takes to create a meaningful change for most vulnerable populations. In his current role of CEO, David leads a team of employees and volunteers who inspire health, healing, and hope by providing counseling, case management, transportation, and food assistance to those who need it most. Welcome, David. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's been like 50 years since uh, HVCC has started. Can you please share the inspiration behind the establishment? Sure. So about 50 years ago, a, a number of individuals in, in the Vernon community were looking to open an office to really uh, provide some additional services to the families in the, in the surrounding communities. And so when they first started, they really were working cooperation with other agencies like Child and Family Services, Big Brothers, uh, uh, health, public health nursing, things of that nature. And so they, they saw a need for counseling services in the community. And as they grew over the years, they, in 1987, for example, they saw the need for a food pantry. And, and then after that, they saw a greater need for additional services for transportation. And so for the last 30 years or so, Hockenham has really been uh, a leader in the local community in providing a variety of social services. Right, and 50 years is such a long time. Isn't, isn't that an easy thing? It, it, is, it is really not an easy thing to run an organization for 50 long years and still continuing, and, and we hope that it goes on and on. How is it possible? How would your experience all the way through this journey? You know, that's a great question because it, it is a, a extraordinarily challenging for any nonprofit to uh, be able to provide services. But not only has Hockenham provided those services, but it has grown. It has grown. I have been with the organization for 21 years, and it has grown from an agency of about 20 employees to almost 50 now. And I think great dedication from the community, a lot of support from the community, um, and the ability of the leadership of the agents over the years to recognize the ever-changing needs in mental health and case management and food insecurity has really been the, the catalyst in, in sustaining the organization. Right. And uh, what we have also seen that many organizations uh, normally limit themselves to a particular area of uh, service, a community service. It is very interesting to see that HVCC has been covering the diversified arenas to help the needy. How could you do that? You know, one of the things that you look at in, in any community is what are the needs? And I think Hockenham recognized that there were multiple needs. There were needs of behavioral health. There were needs of limited transportation. So Vernon and the surrounding communities, although only a, a short ride away from Hartford is still considered a rural community. And so transportation for elderly and disabled was very limited. And so as the agency grew, we began to apply for and develop these services. And what we have found is that diversity is such an advantage to the community. So instead of going to one agency to get your food, another agency to get your basic needs, maybe some case management, and yet another agency to get a ride, and, and yet one more to get your outpatient services, here at Hockenham, we can coordinate that care with one organization on one campus and really meet the needs of the community as a whole person. You, you did bring up some real uh, important issues out there. Now, for example, you did talk about behavioral health, which is, I think, is one of the most neglected fields in relations and lifestyle changes due to the COVID uh, recently has also impacting mental health. 
uh, with lots of anxiety and depression related problems that we are seeing these days. It uh, also highly affects the underprivileged. You seem to providing a lot of services in this field. Could you please elaborate on those? Sure. So it is the largest part of our agency. Um, we provide and uh, outpatient services to about 280 clients a week uh, that we see for individual and group therapy. And COVID created enormous challenges for all of us in the mental health field, not the least of which was switching entirely over to telemedicine on the fly, essentially. So, you know, we, we found out that we we're going to be remote and three days later we were up and running uh, back in 2020 with remote mental health and substance abuse treatment services. What we've seen, the pandemic has really targeted not only those most vulnerable, but another group of individuals who historically might not seek out mental health treatment, have sought it out. The isolation, the depression, unemployment issues, food insecurity have led to a lot of, of emotional issues for individuals that they're still experiencing today. And the COVID uh, impact, uh, I think, will be felt for, for many, many years to come, particularly with uh, the elderly population who felt the isolation and the young uh, population, students and, and young children who felt not only the isolation in social areas, but in some of their development as well. Right, and uh, that brings us to another important uh, mental issue, which is trauma. Uh, you must have also seen a lot of youngsters going through uh, trauma related issues what suggestions uh, would you have to help people try to cope up with such situations? Yeah, so trauma uh, across the board, but particularly with uh, young people is something that we have dedicated some of our staff to provide uh, absolute expertise in trauma-informed care. Um, and one of the things that we really encourage is to engage in services if you are feeling uh, as if you're affected by something. I think the term PTSD sometimes gets overused and people may not feel like they you know, want to say that they have this you know, condition, but I think everyone's trauma is individual. It's, it's not something that can be defined by us. It has to be defined by you. And so I, I really encourage people to look at what it is in their life that was ha, had such a profound impact. A trauma is really, by definition, something that has a profound impact on you and is affecting how you're acting and how you're uh, 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 functioning today. Any experiences that you want to share about uh, youngsters that we have come across with trauma-related issues that you were able to help them out uh, manage those well? Sure. So one example is a, a young person, a high school student, uh, who through the early parts of the pandemic, you know, was home remotely, lost all contact with her friends. And then at some point, students had to return to school and she was terrified of the thought. This was before the vaccines were fully out and certainly they weren't out for young people. And she was terrified at the thought of having to do that and couldn't find her way to be able to get back to school. In addition to that, there were all of the social media pressures that she was under and dealing with because for a long time during the pandemic, that's really the only way to, uh, people communicated and, and, and interacted. And so one of the things that we worked with with this person was trying to identify exactly what her fear was. Was she fearing she was going to get sick? Was she fearing that she would come home and make someone else sick? And so we took some, a, 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 some months really to work with the person to identify what was going on in terms of the fears that she was having. And it turns out her biggest fear was that she would get COVID and give it to her grandmother who was old um, and unable to maybe fight off an infection. And so we worked a plan out with her and her family to ensure that she would be able to uh, communicate those concerns with her, her family members, be able to talk with her and see her grandmother. Remember, she hasn't she, 
during the pandemic, she hadn't had any contact with her grandmother at all for months and months and months. And so we worked with the person. We still work with her now, um, but it's more anxiousness as opposed to feeling tra uh, tra uh, paralyzing trauma. Right. With that, let's let's come to another aspect of uh, uh, Hawken. And I mean, you you share services for elderly people. There is something called as dial a ride, which is a very interesting service being offered. What is the intention intention behind the service, and how is it helping the communities? So, dial a ride is is a great service. It is a what they call a paratransit system. So it's basically a bus system where those that are over the age of 60 or disabled who may not be able to access traditional public transit or public transit in their community may be very limited. They may live in a very rural area. So dial arrive is a door-to-door -door service. So as opposed to waiting at, you know, waiting in town at a bus stop for a ride, dial arrive goes to your doorstep, picks you up, brings you to your appointment and drops you off and then comes back and gets you and brings you home. And that appointment may be a lot of what we do is doctor's appointments for individuals, but that we also go grocery shopping. We also go to department stores. We'll take you to get your hair cut. It's an opportunity for people who otherwise would not be able to have an opportunity any access to transportation to be able to get out in the community and interact and get to the services that they need. And the intent really is uh, at a state and federal level was to provide some sort of public transportation options for those communities that did not fall into the uh, traditional bus services uh, that you see in, in larger cities. Right. For, for the service to run, right, does anyone have to basically make a call or make an appointment or can they just uh, request a dial a ride uh, as soon as they require it? Yeah. So so if you're over 60 and just proof of your date of birth and if you're disabled, just a, a fax from your doctor's office registers you for the service. And you call. so what happens is you call the office and say you need a ride on next Monday at 10 o'clock. To the doctor and uh, provided it's within the uh, areas that we serve and we serve about five towns but we also go to another five towns in the area so we have a pretty wide uh, geography of, of locations that we go to we can provide services as, as often as short as rather uh, two days if you can call me today we could probably get you in a ride by friday and does anybody need to be pre-registered to be able to avail the service? No, nope. it's just when you make the phone call for, and if you're doing it for the very first time, we're going to ask you some basic information over the phone and uh, and then we're going to book the ride. Um, you know, Hockenham's goal with all of the services we provide is to is to break down any of the barriers that, that traditionally occur when uh, looking into services. So we want, if you're looking for a ride, we want you to get that ride as soon as you need it. That's a very wonderful idea. Uh, we, we can all, we also see that uh, Hockenden provides a program to meet the basic needs. What does it mean? Sure. So the basic needs program is really about the case management services that we provide not only to uh, our senior citizens, and we have a specific program for seniors, but basic needs is really to assess the patient's overall needs that they may have. You know, individuals who come to us with food insecurity there are other issues that they're contending with. There may be employment issues that they're contending with or housing issues that they're contending with or other socioeconomic issues that may not be obvious. And so the basic needs case managers are really there to try to make sure that A, if they're eligible for a particular service that they're getting that service or B, connect them to other agencies or connect them to other services in our agency, maybe Maybe in addition to needing counseling, they need transportation, for example. And the final piece of the focus of the basic needs is really to assess what can we do to help this person be less reliant on our services or, and to sustain some independence. And while that process is complicated for some, 
for others, it may just mean that we assist them in trying to find transportation to a job interview or an opportunity to get some uh, clothes for a particular type of job. You know, I remember a situation where a man came and said, you know, he's starting this job and he needs uh, steel-toed boots in order to do the job. You know, we were able to accomplish that and get that uh, to that person so that, again, he can move on and become more independent of, of any service for that matter. That's so very important for anybody trying to uplift their whole life. I mean, how, how do you make aware, pe people make aware of such uh, facilities being available? Uh, do you uh, basically propagate within the communities? Are there any programs to educate uh, communities in and around you? Sure. So we, we spent, you know, it beyond the traditional uh, ways of letting agents, uh, the community know about our services, you know, through websites and, and social media. We also connect with other social service agencies. We connect with courts. We connect with housing authorities. We connect with as many organizations and service industries as we can. Um, and I'll, but I'll tell you that the people who receive the services are often the best advertisers for, for the service because they're telling other people, hey, I went to Hockenham and they were able to help me with this. So yeah, we uh, having opportunities to do grassroots connecting with the community is a key part of what I do in particular in, in going out in the community and talking about the services that we provide. Absolutely, word of mouth is fabulous in terms of trying to spread the message of service. Uh, um, can you can you elaborate on the food pantry program at Hawken and uh, how is it uh, meeting the needs of the communities? Sure. So the food pantry is one of the best in the state of Connecticut, uh, recognized as one of the largest in the state of Connecticut. Um, and our food pantry is a choice food pantry, which means that you come in and you choose the items that you want. Gone are the days uh, of getting a bag of food that's been packed by someone other than yourself. And that is one aspect of our pantry that I'm most proud of is that it's an opportunity for you to choose the food that you want, that you know you're going to eat. And we try to meet the, the dietary needs, the cultural needs that individuals may have. And so you can come weekly to the food pantry um, and pick out those items that you need. And what is what we know in, in Connecticut as well as across the country is food insecurity has taken on a new meaning. You know, the, the stereotypical uh, unemployed person who doesn't have enough money or food is not what food pantries are doing today. Food pantries are serving people who are employed, who are just, as we say, they have more month than money. So be, as they get towards the end of the work week or biweekly or monthly, they find that they're short on funds because of rent and childcare and car payments and all of those expenses and they sacrifice food. And so being a, an agency such as ours where we can meet those needs, um, we're really closing that gap for folks who otherwise would just not, not only not eat well and nutritiously, but in some cases not eat at all. Yeah, nutrition is very important for every individual. It's it's everybody's birthright, right? Um, uh, on the other aspect, uh, what we have seen is that with the current pandemic, ongoing pandemic uh, that has influenced all sections of society, it has been observed that it has also led to an increase in addiction. How is Harkonnen recognizing and addressing addiction during these difficult times? Yeah, you've touched on a, a very significant subject. The pandemic really um, took an issue like the opioid crisis um, and, and magnified it tremendously because options for treatment were so limited. Um, and, and this was a population that needed to engage in service consistently and not miss sessions and, and, and make sure that, that they had those opportunities. And, and we pivoted our services our individual and our group work. We continue to do group work through, even though it was telemedicine, we continue to uh, encourage 
people to interconnect with one another. Uh, we at Hockenham have what we call a medication assisted treatment program, which uh, for us is uh, primarily Suboxone, which is a, a medication that is given to people who have opioid addictions, similar to the, the, the traditional methadone programs. But the difference is it's a prescription that you fill at the farm. And, and so we have multiple substance abuse experts on our staff, and we have been working diligently with the community and other agencies to really wrap around as many services as we could uh, for those suffering with substance abuse. Unfortunately, we saw a rise in opioid-related fatalities and also a rise in the use of other uh, substances. And, and so we expect as we come out of this pandemic at some point and we see more face-to-face -face contact that this issue of substance addiction is going to uh, be something that we're gonna focus on for a long time. The opioid crisis in, in the country and particularly in, in, in urban areas and rural areas as well, um, didn't subside during COVID. If anything, it, it really uh, ballooned into even a greater crisis. And, and so we recognize that we're going to have to adjust our services as the issues adjust uh, as well in the community. And it's so very unfortunate to see uh, people getting impacted and actually we are seeing fatalities due to addiction. It's, it's a very important thing that you are doing that really appreciate that. And in addition to that, I think it is very important that uh, we need to work towards uh, improving the overall skills of an individual to basically overcome all of these issues. Uh, I, I've seen that Hockenen has been conducting several workshops for skill development. Are there other programs uh, similar to these that Hockenen basically take up to provide employment and sustainability to the needy? I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because last year uh, we started a, a very small program uh, called a youth employment program. And what we were doing there is targeting young people between 17 and 22, 23 years of age, and giving them an opportunity to learn some job skills, either in working in our food pantry or working in our offices administratively, or just working in, in a capacity uh, within our office to learn a specific skill. In addition to that, we were working, our program was working with them on uh, resume writing and how to conduct yourself in an interview and how to seek out a job and life management type of things and how to manage your money and so forth. And so we've just expanded that program just now in February, and we're hoping to uh, assist as many as 25 people this year in job development, not only at Hockenham, but in the community and making connections with age, uh, other businesses in the community to work with them to provide uh, employment opportunities and training opportunities to, to young people. You know, there's been a lot of talk about all the jobs that are out there and all the jobs that are available for people, but there's still a, a core group who struggle to find those jobs. And some of our assistance may be simply transportation with through our dial -a ride program to get that person to and from a job. That is a barrier for some people. And for others, it may be just getting started, knowing how to get out there. And for others, it may just be, how do I, how do I, Act at work and how do I interact at work? And for others, it may be I don't have a particular skill that I can offer. So we're very excited about this program um, and expanding it this coming year uh, to open employment opportunities for a, a host of young people. It's so much of good uh, around with your services. We are sure that you would be receiving an overwhelming response from the beneficiaries. How does it feel to recognize gratitude? You know, we are truly grateful to the community and, and, and the support that we receive. And, you know, I think it's important for me to reach out to everyone who donates and helps and volunteers uh, at Hockenham. And, you know, whether it's a youngster who for his birthday, instead of gifts, asks for canned goods to donate to the pantry or a foundation who's giving us a large 
uh, grant to be able to provide a service. Um, it is imperative that we have the support uh, of the community in order for us to sustain ourselves. We could not do it just on our ability to write grants or have you know, contracts or bill insurances. Uh, we couldn't do the work that we do. And, and I'll tell you, um, we, it is humbling at times to see the generosity of the community. Right, any additional support that you are already receiving from the society in fulfilling your causes and all, are you, are you basically doing any fundraising campaigns or uh, any such uh, initiatives that have been taken up to improvise on your support structure? Yeah, so, you know, before COVID, we were much more engaged in, in you know, kind of traditional fundraising type of events, outdoor events, where we would try to attract, uh, you know, groups of people and, and uh, sponsorships and things like that. With COVID, what we really pivoted to is asking organizations or businesses to really support specific programs. So for a quick example, we, we asked individuals and businesses to think about supporting our counseling department with maybe helping the co-pays or the deductibles that our patients have to pay because through insurance that they really can't afford. And that is a barrier for them uh, to receive treatment or to help um, pay for the registration fee for the dial-a-ride recipients. So not only are we helping our organization, but we're targeting your donations specifically to a person or a group of people so that you know where your money is going and how it exactly is being used. There, there are a lot of uh, volunteers and donors uh, talking and uh, what is their key role uh, that you basically are looking for it? Sure. So from the volunteer perspective, Perspective. It starts with our board of directors. Our board of directors are all volunteers, very dedicated to the agency. And then across our programs, but particularly in our food pantry. So most everyone working in the pantry, save for two paid staff, are volunteers. And these volunteers throughout the pandemic and, and now as we're back providing full services have been, are the backbone of what we do. They really are so dedicated to coming each and every day that they're uh, assigned to provide nothing but help and support, help and support to us. But more importantly, th they want, for the most part, most of our volunteers want direct contact with the folks that we're serving. They really enjoy that. And as far as I was talking about you know, youth employment. Some of our volunteers are former educators and business people, and they turn into mentors for young people and show them opportunities and, and skills that they otherwise, we wouldn't have the expertise. As far as our donors are concerned, um, many of our volunteers are donors, but in the general community, there is a loyalty to Hockenham that is uh, very strong in the community, uh, providing uh, contributions. And again, whether it's a bag of food or, or uh, you know, a check, uh, th the community has just been so responsive to what our needs are and what, more importantly, what the community's needs are. Absolutely. The, uh, indeed, there is no uh, second thought about the loyalty of the community in and around yourself, because there's a lot of hard work that is being going on at Hawken and, and uh, probably you're also working towards reaching many goals and offer diversified services. Is there any other dream that you wish to fulfill in the near future? That's a great question. because I'm, I'm talking to you from an office in Norwich. So while um, we are in Vernon, Norwich is about 45 minutes south. And so one of the things that I, I am working on right now is to expand our footprint into other communities as well and to begin to offer services. So I'm sitting in a, a, a brand new outpatient counseling office that we're just now getting underway and, and uh, we hope to have fully operational here in the next couple of months. So one of the goals that I have for our organization to increase its sustainability and to be able to provide these services for 50 more years long after I'm moved on to retirement is to be able to expand the great work that we do into other communities. 
Great, and and congratulations on getting this new office set up, and wish for many many more of such offices coming uh, in the near time as early as possible, so that a lot of people can benefit from it. David, thank you very much for joining us today. We are honored to have you on the show. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Bye.